I'm Miles Lipson at Alabama A&M, participating in the Research Experience for Undergrads program and delivering my second weekly progress report. This is part two of the report on Raman spectroscopy. So I'm going to take you guys through the actual results we've gotten. Just to recap, this is what the actual spectrum for a typical sample will look like. You can see how there's a lot here. This right here, we are pretty sure is background from the Raman spectrum of the lens used to collect the laser, and the rest of this is just the background found through a generic, a generic sample of water or the PVC in the tube. What we really care about is right here, this little peak that occurs at around 1050, and that's the Roman peak associated with the, nitro, with the nitrate peak in the sodium nitrate solution. So all the data you're going to see from us in this presentation is actually zoomed in on that one little section, on this peak right here. So like Josh said, we had two predictions. One that the further you go away, the lower the signal is going to be, and there's going to be an inverse squared relationship between that, and that there's going to be a linear relationship between solution concentration and the strength of the signal, and the values we tested, 1 to 5 meters, and lots of values from 200 to 5,000 parts per million. So I'm just going to take you through the data now and show you graphs. I know there's a lot. Bear with me and show you that sometimes they were as expected and sometimes they weren't as we expected and then explain why. So as you can see here, we have the 5, the 4, and the 3, which look good, but then the 1 and the 2 are reversed. Our signal with the 2 meter peak is a lot higher than the 1. So immediately alarm bells should be going off. And if it was just this one sample, we could think it's an isolated experimental error, but it's not. Here, they look good. But then again, they look bad again. We have the two meters and the one meters being inversed here again at 2,000. Here they look good. Then here we have two very very close signals. They look kind of good, but you have a background on the two peak on the two meter si signal being higher than the one meter, and you have for some reason large deviation between these two and these three. Then here between the one meter and the two meter, again, two meter far higher than the one. Here we have data that looks good, although for some reason we don't seem to have a peak for the four meter for some reason. And then for 4500, just one more after this, you can see this data looks kind of good, but for some reason the three peak is higher than the four peak. And then with the five, again, you have this division. So what we, th and then just to summarize all those, we have intensity as a function of distance. What we've done here is taken each of the concentrations and plot plotted the intensities of the varying differences. What we'd expect is an inverse squared relationship, so kind of like this. And we see roughly that, but you also have these random peaks up in the center, like here and here. And so we're thinking this doesn't demonstrate the results we expected anywhere near as clearly as we we're hoping. <clears throat> and then what comes to concentration? Yeah, they're kind of lines, but it's very questionable. So what's going on? And we have one main hypothesis, and that's ideally it would go like this, the laser beam hits the mirror, hits the sample, and then it bounces straight back. However, that's an ideal. What we think is actually happening is they're not perfectly aligned. So the probe beam hits the mirror, hits the sample, but rather than bouncing back to a probe, it's bouncing out at a different angle. And so when we're setting up the mirrors at varying differences, because it's not perfectly perpendicular, the actual signal strength we're getting back is variable based on how well they're aligned. And it's not something that's easy to correct. And therefore, what we're thinking is the base amplitude is not constant across all trials. So the trend which we were hoping to see might be there in relative terms, but not in absolute terms. So we think we have to apply a baseline function that's present in the Ramon software to all the data and normalize the data. And then once we do that, we believe we'll see the trends. And we've only had time so far to do that for one of our samples, and that's the 5,000. But as you can see, we have these nice clear relationship with five and four and three and two and one. And the relative differences here make us think that it's a lot closer to our expected relationship. So we'll be working on that. And also doing the same thing for the ammonium nitrate peaks once we get a chance to do that as well.